Hi there and welcome to a British audio file. My name is Taryn and in this episode I'm going to examine my top five inexpensive hi-fi tweaks. Now I'm going to say from the offset I'm not a great tweaker. I'd rather spend my money on upgrading equipment than on buying gizmos but these fall into the general category of good housekeeping. So I'm talking about stuff that helps reduce vibrations in your system and lower the noise floor. So let's get started. Now those of you who watched my video on cables may have noted that when I spoke about speaker cables I recommended that you got speaker cables that weren't shielded and the reason for that is that adding shielding to any cable increases its capacitance and you don't want to unduly increase the capacitance of a cable if it isn't necessary. The reason it's not necessary on a speaker cable is that your speaker is a relatively low impedance load. Um, it's typically 4 or 8 ohms. As a result the current that your amplifier supplies to the speaker is very high, relatively high, and the signal to noise ratio is high. The amount of noise that you're picking up from radio frequencies which is RF or electromagnetic induction which is EMI is negligible in that kind of environment. So shielding a cable is just going to be detrimental rather than beneficial when you're talking about speaker cables. Now what you can experiment with is adding ferrite cores. So I've got, they come in different sizes and shapes but there's some examples here, I hope you can see those clearly. And what you want to do is choose one that fits quite snugly and what this is really is effectively a magnet that you're clamping round one side, I'll explain why you do one side in a second. So you want a nice tight fit and you connect that on to one of your uh, ends of your speaker uh, cable. Now the reason you don't want two is that obviously if you've got two magnets in close proximity you've got um, magnetic fields that are interfering with each other. The other reason is that these add inductance so if you get too much of this or too many of these on you'll get a little bit of high frequency roll off but one of them quite snugly fit on, shouldn't really have any real effect on uh, the frequency range but what it does do is it provides a radio frequency choke and it may also help with reducing a little bit of EMI as well. So worth playing around with, they're relatively expensive, I think you can get a pack of 10 of them for about £10. Just to be crystal clear, you place one of these ferrite cores on one of the connections at the speaker end of your cable. Obviously you do it at the speaker end because the signal is passing from your amplifier to your speaker. So what you're doing is getting rid of any RF that the cable may be picking up along that signal path. I wouldn't put it on interconnects because your interconnects are likely to be already shielded. So what you're doing is basically adding inductance for no added benefit. Um, if you've got captive mains leads, you may want to try putting one of those on at the end of... Um, your mains lead where it goes into your equipment because it may or may not have a benefit at that point as well in terms of reducing RF and a little bit of EMI coming into your um, equipment. I think it's beneficial to make some effort to reduce the vibrations in your system as well. Now that could be the vibrations that your equipment experiences, your preamplifier, amplifier, DAC, turntable, all your speakers and your subwoofer. And if we're talking about speakers first, traditionally what was used is spikes. And I think still a lot of people I see tend to use spikes. And that's kind of this kind of arrangement where you have a spike under your speaker um, and if it's carpeted it goes straight through um, if it's not, if it's on a wooden floor, you'll see this kind of arrangement underneath where you've put something to protect the floor by having the spike going into this kind of metal disc. Now, these are fine. Uh, it's what traditionally has been used, but they do not significantly reduce vibrations. Uh, you're still effectively coupling your speakers to the floor. 
I think the only time I would use these is if I had a concrete floor because that's so heavy and so dense that the vibrations that your speakers are producing aren't really going to translate to the floor. If you've got a wooden suspended floor, even if you've got carpet on top of it, these spikes are going to excite vibrations in that floor. And I think you're much better off rather than trying to couple your speakers to the floor to decouple of them, decouple them. And with that regard, I would use something like this. There are fancy decoupling devices. People like ISO Acoustics will charge you 150 pounds for four kind of isolation devices. But these are what are used underneath washing machines. And they come in white, black, and I think you can get these for about five or six pounds for a pack of four. And they work pretty well in terms of reducing vibrations. Uh, they're designed to reduce vibrations from washing machines and you know that they can vibrate significantly. Uh, they may not have the extended frequency range uh, in terms of reducing vibrations that perhaps you know the fancy audiophile solutions have, but in terms of low frequencies, which is where it's most critical reducing uh, vibrations, they work really effectively. And I'm going to say they're five or six pounds for a pack of four. Place those under your speakers, under your subwoofer, and decouple them from a floor. Under your equipment, I would use something called Sorbothane. That's sorb. I think it might be pronounced Sorbothane. Um, and these are about fifteen pounds a pack of four, and they're a lot softer than the anti-vibration kind of discs that you use for the speakers but these work really well and it's known to be a material that's very good at uh, absorbing vibrations across the entire frequency range like I say 10-15 pounds for a pack of four worth sticking these underneath each one of your equipments it will significantly reduce the vibrations valve gear is known to be microphonic which means that the vibrations get translated into a audio signal Electronic uh, solid state gear, uh, less so, but still good housekeeping to try and eliminate as many of those vibrations as possible. Over the years, I've always had a love hate relationship with mains conditioners. Now, more of hate than love, if I'm honest. And the reason is that I've always had them in my system for a few weeks and got rid of them. And just before I get into that, I'll just briefly explain what a mains conditioner is. So you can see here beside me, it's normally a power strip which has a filter built in. And the purpose of the filter is to protect your equipment from surges. So it could be a lightning strike or any other reason why you may have an electrical surge coming through your equipment. And it also eliminates radio frequency and electromagnetic interference. Uh, noise getting into your sensitive electronic equipment which has a benefit sonically. So all good news that's thus far. The problem is that they've always traditionally put a little bit of a stranglehold on dynamics. You feel as if it sucks a little bit of the life out of the system. I've tried a bunch of them over the years. This one here is by Tassima. That's T-A-C-I-M-A -A, and it's available here through Amazon in the UK for 35, 40 pounds. I'm sure it's available in other countries as well. And this one doesn't tend to be too intrusive. It seems to have a lot of those benefits without a loss of dynamics. I've tried it in all three of my systems. So that's my Hegel and Exposure with the Proax um, in the main system. I've tried it with my Technics vintage amplifier and Celestrion speakers that you see here beside me and my Audio Lab and PSB set up in the bedroom. And in each case, what I've noticed is that the noise floor seems to have shifted down. That means that tiny little details pop out of the recording much more easily. It's as if you can hear a little bit further into the recording and there's also a little bit more refinement and extension at the top end, the high frequencies, and without any real perceived loss in dynamics. So for once I've come across a relatively inexpensive uh, mains conditioner which has many of the benefits that are associated with mains conditioners but not the drawbacks. So 
I think it's worth checking out and I think people's mileage just generally does tend to vary with these kind of devices so um, you may or may not experience the same things all I can talk to you about is the three systems that I've tried and the experiences have been positive so I would recommend trying this uh, uh, mains conditioner out from Tassima. What I use alongside my power strip mains conditioner is a parallel mains conditioner. Now I have a couple of these devices here. First one is from Tassima, the same people who uh, make that uh, main strip power conditioner that I spoke about earlier. Now, just to be clear, I have no association with this company. They don't know me from Adam. I've never spoken to them. I don't get paid for recommending this stuff. I just happen to find that a couple of their devices seem to work really well. So what you do is you plug this into a spare power socket right next to where you plug your power main strip where you have the rest of your equipment. So this goes in the spare socket, the strip goes in the socket next to it. Um, obviously all your equipment is connected to the uh, strip. And there's this one from Tassima. I'd say about 40 pounds off Amazon, that one. This is 100 pounds here in the UK and that's from iFi. It's an AC purifier, works I think in a similar way. This is an active mains conditioner and essentially what it does is it works similarly to the way the noise cancelling headphones work it kind of monitors the signal the noise coming off the mains and puts an inverted signal in to reduce the noise floor i find that these work pretty well now again your mileage will vary based on your equipment i've tried this out with all three of my setups and the results have been fairly consistent in terms of uh, opening up of the sound stage, uh, increased resolution, micro dynamics and micro details pop out a little bit more clearly, a much more fluid and kind of extended top end. So I've been really impressed with these devices and um, the iFi one is a little bit better than the Tassima one but it's also two and a half times the price and I think these are actually even more effective than the main strip so if I was going to start I'd probably start with the parallel device first because I think the improvement is more dramatic than it is with the uh, main strip power conditioner from Tassima that I spoke about just a moment or two ago. A few weeks ago I produced a video on cables where I spoke about speaker cables and interconnects. I didn't mention power cables and a few people pointed that out in the comments section. I think essentially the same principle applies to power cables that applies to speaker cables and interconnects. At the end of the day they are all carrying an electrical signal. And my conclusion in that video was that in order to get a well engineered cable with good electrical properties you don't have to spend a fortune. You can buy speaker cables and interconnects from companies like Belden, Lap, Van Dam for interconnects for 40, 50 pounds, speaker cables for five to 10 pounds a meter. And I would extend that argument to uh, power cables as well. Now, the biggest criticism of power cables is that essentially what difference can it make changing the cable in the last meter and a half run from the power socket to your equipment when you've got reams of it around your home that aren't fancy and are just regular cables? Well, my answer to that is that when you've got cables running around in your home circuit, they effectively are in a relatively low noise environment because there aren't many other cables in proximity. Now, depending on how much equipment you have at the back of your hi-fi rack, you may have a lot of cables in close proximity to each other. You'll have power cables for each of your uh, pieces of equipment, you'll have speaker cables, you'll have interconnects, potentially all interfering with each other. So I think it's sensible and prudent to pay some attention, get rid of the cheap uh, generic stuff that you get given to you for free and have a nice 
shielded cable with good quality conductors of a decent gauge and reasonable terminations on each end. And again, as I mentioned with speed cables and interconnects, you don't have to spend a fortune. So to illustrate that point, this is a generic um, cable that you get, IEC connector here, three pong ones, sometimes you get the figure of eight ones, but um, that's a standard one. I've just basically shortened this one because it's was using this as a short run. And that's what you'll get. And if you compare that to this cable from LAP, pull that out. I'm not sure if this comes across clearly. Maybe I'll post some pictures up. You'll notice that the LAP cable is an awful lot thicker. And that's because it uses two and a half millimeter conductors. The insulation is a lot heavier and there's a braided shield around the outside. So all in all, the construction is far more substantial than the generic freebie cable that you get. Now this cable from LAP retails for around seven pounds a meter. So it's not particularly expensive. I purchased it from a company called Mains Cables R Us, M-C-R-U.co.uk. And an alternative is the Belden 19364, which again is around seven pounds a meter. Again, very substantially built, two and a half meter conductors, good insulation, a foil shield around the outside as opposed to a braided shield. And that's probably the only real significant difference. I use fairly generic connectors, a three point plug on one side and Martin Kaiser um, connectors on the other side, no soldering involved, just screw them in. And all in all, you can produce one of these cables for a one meter run for about 15 pounds. If you want to have it built for you, uh, you can have them done for about 50, 60 pounds. So it's quite a substantial saving if you want to do it yourself. Disclaimer here, only try and do that if you're comfortable with how to wire up a plug and connect the shield. Essentially, the shield needs to be kind of terminated along with the earth connection on both ends and you need to make sure that the shield doesn't get in contact with any of the other conductors. So if you're not confident doing that yourself, you're probably better off spending the 50, 60 pounds and getting someone else to do it. But as I say, if you are comfortable with wiring a plug and connecting a shield to the earth on both ends, then you can save yourself quite a bit of money and produce one of these cables for 15 pounds. Now these tweaks that I mentioned from the ferrite core at the end of your speaker cable to the isolation pads under your speakers and your equipment, the mains conditioning power strip, the parallel mains conditioner, and finally the shielded power cords all fall in the area of tweaks. And as a result, in isolation, I'm not saying that one of these things makes a huge difference to how your system is going to sound, but all these little improvements add up and there is an accumulative effect. I think that these fall into the area of good housekeeping. And you know that once you've taken care of these things that the, your system isn't going to be adversely affected from vibrations and you've eliminated the source of electrical, radio frequency and EMI noise coming in, and potentially upsetting sensitive equipment. They're on the list because they're inexpensive and I think they're worth giving a go and having a try. So hopefully you've found something beneficial from this video. If you like it, please hit that like button. Uh, please share it. If you like my approach to hi-fi, please subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. Thank you to my 6,000 um, subscribers out there. This channel has already grown way beyond my expectations. So we'll see where it goes from here. And for today, for now, a British audiophile signing off.